photography, you can see really something very, uh, very, very interesting. And uh, this is also very cross-disciplinary areas. You now we cover physics, chemistry, biology, uh, material science, and you know, nanoscience, and also uh, um, big data and the machine learning is a very important part of uh, these projects. Now, I believe there are revolutions in the imaging and um, structure determination field. Uh, now, when you were high school, you know, when we were high school students, we, you know, we, we probably did some experiment when turn on the knob, optical microscope, and look at insects, get a magnified image. Most of the people still have that perception about the micro microscopy. I think that's just you, know, you turn the knob, and but this has been changed so much. I mean, it's, it's not. It's not only just a resolution from microns to anshams, uh, you know, optical microscopy is about 100, 200 nanometer in resolution. And the super resolution fluorescent microscopy can get it to 10 nanometer. And the CDI is a 3D um, X-ray nan nanoscopy. And the electron microscopy, atomic resolution, x crystallography can get it uh, better than even y anshams. And also the time scale from minutes to attosecond, and the light travels very fast, about a three anshram per attosecond. So one attosecond, 10 to minus 18 seconds. The reason I believe the revolution in this field is because the brilliant X-ray sources, such as X-ray free electron lasers, are very expensive sources. One of each one costed more than hundred, uh, no, hundreds of million dollars, some of the more than billion dollars, and also advanced synchrotrons, ablation collected electron microscopy, and a powerful imaging methods such as supernatural fluorescent microscopy, cryEM. Now cryEM actually uh, helped uh, uh, develop this. Uh, vaccine for COVID-19. They, they look at the first of the structures. Uh, I think in the, uh, January 2000, uh, 2020, 2020 uh, January, and the paper was published from submission publication nine days in science. So really helped the society uh, to you know um, tackle this, uh, develop this, uh, help develop this vaccine, and also see the coin defy imaging, and. Uh, the, I think the revolution is not only just the, um, the source and the method, but also detectors and um, algorithms, like high dynamic uh, range detectors, single photon electron counting, and advanced algorithms, bigger data, fast computer and machine learning. All this is just like, a, I think it's a perfect wave for this uh, very important field. Now, the, here I'm gonna show some just uh, the breakthrough in the coherent X-ray sources. As I mentioned, X-ray free electron laser, um, uh, so how to qu quantify the, uh, the um, uh, yes, uh, this one. So how to quantify the, uh, the coherent flux we use called so-called brilliance. The brilliance, uh, if you look at the last uh, six uh, decades, it's about a 12 order magnitude uh, from the you know, X-ray generator to X-ray free electron lasers. But compared to the, the Morse law, uh, it's most loss of six decades, 12 orders, but uh, coherent X-ray flux of 20 orders magnitude in six decades. And also the time scale is getting shorter and shorter you know, from, um, this actually mainly uh, uh, Margaret Monet and Henry Captain's group did very important work to push this shorter pulse. And then also the high energy of the photons. So you can study uh, materials, look inside the materials and study high, ultra fast phenomena. Now, so that's the kind of a source. Now, next, I'm going to briefly mention about the method. I'm going to focus on this CDI that's in my heart. Um, if you have a chance to come to Los Angeles, there's a, a nice place. It's called the Huntington uh, Libraries and, and the Gardens. In, in that uh, place, there, it's very close to Caltech. And uh, there's uh, uh, some old books. One of them was written by Robert Hooke. And uh, so this is... Uh, and he used a microscope that was built in around 1670. And then he looked at all kinds of different uh, structures, you know, magnified view, and he handed you, at that time, of course, there's no detectors, right? There's no film, and everything handed you. And he wrote a very thick book. And I was very impressed by, by this book and very, very thick, handed you all the information. And then he coined this uh, term cell, biological term cell was first coined by Robert Hooke. Now, so this is really 1670. And uh, since then, the last 300 years, lens-based microscopy have played a very, very important role, such as optical phase contrast, fluorescence, confocal, super resolution, and electron microscopy. All the lens is just to do the Fourier transform, just like your eyes do Fourier transform. Now, there's another way to do Fourier transform. You just measure the uh, diffraction pattern or scattering pattern. Uh, 
Um, so one of my former students did a very interesting experiment. So she took two images, these two images, okay, uh, the same size and the, the, the same grayscale. And then she took a, a Fourier transform these two images. So you get Fourier transform, get a magnitude in the face, right? So she switched switch the face. So combine the magnitude free transform with the face of this to inverse fast free transform. The magnitude of this one with the face of this one, the inverse uh, free transform. And this one looks like the B because the face information from B. This looks like A because the face information from A. So your eyes or my eyes more sensitive to the face. Although completely wrong magnitude, as long as can get collect, collect the face information, we still be able, able to recognize it. Now, unfortunately, face information cannot be directly measured. So it's a well-known face problem. So when I was graduate, I did this experiment. We uh, measured this interference pattern, dif uh, diffraction pattern. You just shine you know, x-rays or any, any wave on the sample, and, and you get this interference pattern, okay, the scattering pattern. And then we use algorithm, and then we can, uh, I just showed the iterative algorithm to can uh, reconstruct this image from this diffraction pattern. This is why we use, you can think we use computation as a, as a lens. To play, we, it's a com, use a computation algorithms uh, to replace a physical lens. And uh, it turns out if you can measure good diffraction pattern, this can be a perfect lens. So after this experiment demonstration, uh, at the beginning, the people were suspicious how this will really work. And uh, after, uh, several years, I mean, now it's almost, uh, almost uh, 20 years. And this has become a very important field. A CDI method has been brought applied to physical and biological sciences, single tron radiation, x fail electron lasers, high harmonic generation, electron and light microscopy. So different CDI methods, including plane wave CDI, tachography or scanning CDI, and there's a black CDI. Actually, those three are more kind of popular. So a few years ago, uh, um, Several of us wrote a review article in Great Margaret and myself. Uh, review article in science. This has been well kind of received by the community. This talk, I'm going to focus on AET and uh, atomic electron tomography. Well, why this is important? Uh, and I keep on asking before I develop AET, why is the 3D atomic structure of a matter so important to modern science? And this is the first 3D atomic structure determined by X rays, which was uh, salt, sodium chloride. I mean, you, you use it every day. And this was solved more than a uh, uh, hundred years ago by Bragg in the 1914. So you can um, uh, sodium atoms and the chlorine atoms. You can see this is in the high school textbooks, right? And this shows uh, the first 3D atomic model of a protein. This is the first protein structure solved in myoglobin uh, by John Kendrew in 1959. Uh, so what it, uh, I think the biologists did a, a really very important thing. They, they deposit, after they solved the structure, they deposit the atomic model in the protein data bank. And this is the first uh, de deposition code, this is one, one MBN. And uh, this is why it's so important uh, to the um, biology and the life science field. It's because it becomes, the, the, you have the coordinates. Then even nowadays, right? If you solve the protein structure, you can compare with this, the, the positive one and uh, look at the active site. The active site, that's very, very important, right? Active site, that's the protein function at the active site. Uh, now, 3D atomic structure determine the physical property and the protein functions. They're saying a picture is worth a thousand words. But in my opinion, a 3D atomic model worth a thousand pictures because, because it's become immortal. If we deposit, right, this solved 1959, and nowadays we're still using, scientists still using this uh, model because you can compare with the new protein structures and look at the active sites. Now, this is great, but, uh, but it requires crystal. Uh, in nature, we know perfect crystal rare. Real materials often contain crystal defect disorder, and uh, which strongly influence material properties and performance. So AET combined advanced electron microscopy with novel imaging reconstruction method to determine the 3D coordinates of individual atoms and real materials. And the reason we, I, we were able to develop this AET is we use some of the method from CDI to the AET. It's really made a, a great impact. So the cross-disciplinary research I find is so important because we can, um, sometimes, you know, you work in a field, you have a blind spot, okay? Just like look at it here. So why tomography, it's a rabbit of a 2D projection like a hand, um, but it's actually a rabbit. Only you get a 3D, you can see it. So we did is we, we developed some powerful algorithms 
and it applied it to a different field and it really solved some important problems. So how does AET work? We use the electron microscope and we take the images um, for the sample and this resolution, 2D image is very high resolution. Okay, we can get a you know, sub uh, one angstrom resolution or close. And it, but the question, how can get with 3D, right? As I just showed the rabbit, how can get a rabbit from the hands? And uh, so we use algorithm, you know, iterative algorithms, the algorithm iteration between Leo and the reciprocal space. And uh, so we've been collaborating with um, some other, uh, some um, mathematician, applied mathematician like Stan Osher's group at the uh, UCLA and uh, uh, we continue to improve these algorithms. So this actually become very, very important part uh, for this research. So we published uh, quite a few high impact papers, including the first experiment demonstration AET. Here we, we without assume crystallinity, we don't make any crystallinity assumption, you can look at, see the individual atoms. And here we see this called a dislocation, screw dislocations. Now screw dislocation is a very, very important, you know, it's, 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 but nobody's seen it before in the core of the screw dislocation. This is the atom, you can see the red and, uh, and uh, green atoms, the actually the kind of a slightly kind of twisted. You can see this zigzag pattern. And uh, it's very difficult to see by any other method. And then here we, uh, this is actually work in collaboration with Hendrick's group and uh, we determine the 3D coordinates of individual atom with 19 picometer precision. Uh, remember the, um, the, the, radio, the, the, the diameter of the hydrogen atoms are about 53 picometers. So we can get very high precision. It's not a resolution, but we can localize uh, the atoms very high precision. And here we, we can decipher the 3D chemical order disorder. Um, at the, of the nanoparticles. So I will give a few examples on the AET. I, I, I found it really very powerful. Now, one of the, our directions that in our proposal, in our, um, you know, this is data science, the uh, HDI proposal is the uh, heterostructures, right? And uh, so I hope that the AET can make an important impact to this direction. And uh, now 2D materials, uh, Van der Waals heterostructure, it's, it's a, a very important uh, field, right now, a hard field. And why is because there's a lot of interesting properties. For example, they can have a metallic and a semiconducting and insulating because based on how you are um, stacking and they also can have a superconducting uh, features. And, uh, but uh, all this related to the disorder structure and the defects. It's a very, very important role, including so-called grain boundary. They form uh, you know, different grain, which means they have the stru crystal structure different. And you have the vacancy means there's some atoms actually missing. And you can have line defects. You can see this actually, you can see line kind of shifted and a ripple like a 2D materials. It's not a perfectly flat. You can have a perfectly flat. Actually, they're always at atomic scales, you have ripples. So we, we look at this for the first time, we look at a 3D. Now we, we can reconstruct it. This is actually the reconstruction of a, a really doped moly disulfide, okay? So, the high contrast corresponds either Rini or Mori. So far, it's kind of a relatively low contrast because our techniques are kind of related to the Z, atomic number. So the largest atomic number, the high the contrast. So after it goes through, you can see atom is kind of a little elongated. That's because our, the, the Kyoto range, we cannot go beyond plus or minus 90 degrees. And then from this reconstruction, we can trace the individual atom, we can, which means we can find the, the centroid, the center of this each blob. And then we can look, identify the, the position of atom with very high precision. So in this region, we identify total more than 2,100 atoms, including uh, 686 uh, moly, and the sulfur is more than 1,300, and the renin, the, do, the, the, the dope is 21, and there's also vacancy. So for vacancy is about 16. And to quantify our precision, so uh, this is our experimental projection, and then we also use our atomic model. We can do simulate a uh, computer on the, uh, uh, in a simulate electron microscope on, on the computer. We can generate so-called multi-slides simulations. And if you plot them together, they have perfect, almost a very good match. And then we can, from this multi-slice projection, we can do the uh, do exactly the same procedure. We can determine the, the coordinates um, uh, from this uh, simulated data and then compare with the experiment data. We can precisely estimate the precision. The precision for the ring is 12 picometers and more is four picometers. It's really precise. One picometer 10 to minus 12 meters. So, the, so far, it's 
uh, about 15 picometers. So very, very accurate uh, precision. And this uh, we can show after we get it so high precise uh, atomical coordinates, we can look at the gray correspond perfect MOS too, but the color correspond the, the atomic coordinate determined by our technique. You can see there are some lot of deviations. And especially whenever there's whenever there's a dopants, uh, the black, or there's a vacancy, the pink, the, and there's a larger deviation along the z-axis. You can see this, uh, look at the z-axis. And uh, now this is understandable because x, y, there's a kind of confinement, but the z-axis there, it's, it's not a confined. So uh, 2D materials, uh, that's kind of, it's names of 2D, but the third dimension we find, it's, um, it's probably as important of if not more. And uh, now here shows uh, this rainy doped moly disulfide. The, the black dots corresponds either moly atoms or rainy atoms. And you can see there are ripples, okay? The ripple is small, it's plus, plus minus 0.6 angstrom. One angstrom 10 to minus 10 angstroms, okay? And uh, we can also look at individual um, dopants and then their env local environment. So these uh, dopants are renin dopants. When we just replace a moly with a, a renin and uh, these ones without the dopants and you know, with the dopant, without dopants, there's some bound difference, distortion. And this one was with one dopant with one vacancy. So this atom's not there, so if atom not there. So there's a larger distortion and there's two dopants. You can see the bound lens changed and also angle changed. So we can quantify the bound lens change due to the dopants. This actually can clearly see the difference. And so all angle change due to the dopants. And we also quantify so called the strand. Strand tensor, just if you put a, a kind of a, a, a dopants as a different atom inside the kind of a crystal structure, 2D materials, this will create some kind of a, um, deviation of the local environment. And we find actually we can quantify the deviation induced by single atom. I can see the, the uh, circle corresponds the renin dopants and the color corresponds the kind of the strand, the strand tensor unrelated to deviation, local deviations. You can see whenever, especially on the uh, epsilon z, z direction, um, whenever there's dopants is a large kind of strand, uh, strand, uh, strand tensors. And the strain is, is, is a tensor, so it's a three by three uh, uh, matrix. So you can see we, we can find all these uh, six components. And then we did another thing very important. So because our coordinates, experiment determined coordinates is so accurate, so it can be directly used as input for DFT and MD uh, uh, calculations. So this case we did uh, was MD calculations uh, in collaborating with a group from Harvard, uh, uh, pre Nalens group. And so here, using the experiment coordinates, then you can directly calculate the band structure, the electronic structure. So it's okay, this is a band structure. This is fine, this is indirect band gap because this band gap is this distance, this point, the gamma point, it's closer than this distance. Okay, so this is called indirect band gap. Um, but for after then you relax our experiment coordinates and calculate again, you find the direct band gap. So you can see this distance is shorter than any other distance. Um, so you can see clearly a difference. So the experimental coordinates, we, we believe this experimental co co coordinates correspond to the matter stable state of this head 2D materials or head load structures. And when you relax it, then kind of, a, you know, it's a kind of a global minimum. So you get a band, you like the band gap. So we also did it whenever there are some um, two linear dopants, you can see with experimental coordinates, there are some shadow bands. It's a very complicated band structure. When they lack the structures, they become more kind of a clean. And then we did a measurement we, we use uh, photoluminescence measurement. We confirmed for linear dopant um, MOS2, there's actually indeed this indirect band gap. So confirm this, our use experimental coordinates, the direct input is correct. And then if you relax the experimental coordinates and then become kind of a global um, a minimum and then becomes, it's not a consistent with actually photoluminescent measurement. So you can see that's, uh, we point to new direction that are using our measure, accurate measurement combined with our computation, uh, every initial cal calculations such as DFT and, and MD, we can uh, uh, probe the true properties of the 2D materials and the structures. So in the following, I want to um, give it two more examples. I thought it's very interesting. Why is the one that started phase transition iron platinum? So iron platinum one synthesized at room temperature, you can see form this is called a disordered phase centered cube. Okay, it's got A1 phase, which means they form this kind of a cubic with the atom at the 
center of the face, okay, and the corner. But we don't know which atoms are on which atom the pattern. So we get chemical order disorder. Then we, after annealing the sample at, the, for example, uh, 500 degrees for half an hour, and then they form this uh, ordered FCT called L1 zero phase, which means there's symmetry breaks along this Z axis. Now, this is a platinum atom, this iron atom, they form layered structures. So the L1 zero iron platinum exhibits extremely large magnetocrystalline anisotropy energy, and it's among the most promising candidates for next generation magnetic storage media. Okay, that's actually it's very so technologically is very very important. So we use this iron pattern as a, as a study as a nucleation. Now nucleation is a very important role in many physical and biological phenomena, so ranging from crystallization and melting to the formation of clouds and the in initiation of the neurodegenerative disease. For example, if you put a glass of water in a freezer, okay, in a freezer, after a few days it become ice, a block of ice, right? And this is a kind of a um, phase transition, but at the beginning of the phase transition, it's a nucleation. So how this um, ice starting form from uh, um, water. Now, nucleation is a very challenging process to study in experiment. Uh, when several atom uh, new molecules start to form a new phase from the parent phase. So we use these systems, uh, use chemical order disorder of the iron platinum to study. We first did a controlled experiment. So we took two independent data from the same sample. Okay? And then we trace the individual atoms. Again, okay? you can see the core, it's a platinum rich core. And uh, the red corresponds iron atom, the platinum, the blue. And you can see the overall is quite, looks quite similar. There's some small change at the surface, actually. Overall, more than 95% atom consistent. So which <laughs> indicated, you know, um, our method is quite good and the precision 26. Picometer. And you can see D and F correspond individual atoms. The blue dot correspond iron atoms, and the red uh, uh, the blue correspond platinum atoms, and red correspond iron atoms. Okay. And then we did a very <laughs> challenging experiment. So while my former postdoc, now he became an assistant professor in the Peking University. And he did a kind of, a, I really felt it's a heroic experiment. So he put this sample in, and he first a new sample for nine minutes at 500, about 500 Celsius. And then a new 90 minutes, and then put an electron microscope, took a data. He get a 3D reconstruction. And then he took a sample out and have to go through air and put it in another chamber, a kneeling chamber for another seven minutes. And then he put the nanoparticle back. Now the nanoparticle is about eight nanometer in diameter. He had to find the same nanoparticle again. Now there's a saying in the States, right? It's, it's very finding a um, needle in a haystack. It's very, very challenging, right? To find a needle in the haystack, but it is even more challenging. Again, think about it. Find the eight nanometer nanoparticles from the Trinity uh, nanoparticles because the sample holder is like a nanometer, the sample holder nanometers. And we want to find individual atoms in this nano. What? Because this is the kind of we want to find, see, some atoms should be consistent, some atoms should change because after annealing, right? And indeed, if you look at it, and the atom, this is a single slide, individual atom. You can see the two atoms of iron. You can see here, and this is exact same. So basically in the core, they, they have no way, it's just like in the uh, kind of a lattice, they cannot change much. So they're stacked. But on the surface, they slide, you can, you can be changed. Some atoms rearranged them. And then he did it again, he did a three time point. He took a sample out and get another, a needle for another 10 minutes and then, and you can see this is clearly is the, the shape actually changed, but the core remained the same. Amazingly, core remained the same. And you can shape changed from more kind of random to layer structures, iron, platinum, iron, platinum kind of layer structure. So we use this called order parameter, it's called L10 phase to quantify L. It's called L10 phase, okay? If one means a perfect L10, means perfect order, zero means perfectly chemically disordered. And then we can, Look at it, identify this uh, the, the nuclei, and we found most of the nuclei. We found more than fifty something, fifty five nuclei, and this nucleus mostly on the surface. Um, or yes, so which means if you put a glass of water in your freezer, ice first form on the surface. Okay, that's now there are some studies. If you put a water, pure water, uh, a bigger bucket without any kind of charge to reduce the surface, and in the volume. Try to get ice in the volume, you will take uh, uh, many years, okay, 50 years to get ice. And uh, the reason is the uh, surface, the heterogeneous nucleation energy is lower. This is actually indeed confirmed. Most of the you know, dots, 
it's on the surface, not on the surface or facets. And then we can look at the dynamics. Nobody has seen it before. Now. This is for, really for the first time. This actually this is red colors from uh, iron and a blue colors from the platinum. And we use this order parameter. You can see this, this nucleus, this nucleus is actually getting larger, more atoms form, right? And we, we use this order parameter, uh, quantify and the different color correspond. This order parameter 0.7 is a red, and the purple is a 0.5. And the lighter blue is a point three. So this actually clearly sees the nuclear getting larger. We call it glowing nucleus. And here, this one is large, small, and large. This is we call a fluctuating nucleus. And this is two merging into one. This is three merging into one and then divide into, into two. And here, this one dissolves the nucleus. So we see all the kinds of this kind of a dynamic fluctuations for the first time at the atomic scale of nucleation. And here shows. Uh, this is one growing nucleus, and we using this as a different crystal orientations. Okay, this is one 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 zero one 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 direction. So we look at the order parameter distribution. Okay, the order parameter are getting larger. You can see the center is getting larger, and we also find every nucleus a core of uh, uh, with the largest order parameter. Every nucleus, there's no exception. Everyone has a core, which means the nucle the nucleation started from that core. This core can be one or few atoms, so this core is the largest. And it's, it's a one 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 duration, one one duration, all largest. This is the radio average. And then we took the derivative because there's a gradient. So we can take a, we can take the order parameter uh, difference. So we take a gradient. We can see the core, it's a, it's a cent, it's not necessarily center, but uh, usually uh, it's, it's uh, could be, in this case, it's close to the side of the, uh, the, the nucleus. And the, the point, the, the vector always point. Um, uh, from the core towards the boundary. You can see there's a kind of, the, we're gonna order parameter gradient points from the core to the boundary, right? And, uh, and then we also, uh, this work is collaborating with uh, Hendrik uh, Hans group and uh, uh, they did some very nice um, MD simulations, uh, use uh, force field and uh, they indeed verified at a different time. You can see, for example, in this case, this is a glowing nucleus and this one is a, fluctuating nucleus, this one, um, one becomes a two, can see two, and this is a dissolving nucleus. And if you plot these four cases, you can indeed see um, the, this, the time at different time. You can see this one growing, this at the early time, 100, 170 picosecond, 200 picosecond, 200, so you can grow in, and this one actually is fluctuating, you can see, right? And the first small, and then getting large, and then small again. And this one kind of dissolve, uh, divided into the two and this dissolved. So this all this seems consistent um, with our experiment observation. Now, so all our uh, experiment observation and uh, um, MD simulation indicated that the classical nucleation actually breaks down at atomic scale. Now classical nucleation theory, it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the, many textbooks. It's a very simple and but, uh, Elegant uh, um, theory, this delta G corresponds to uh, a free energy change. Okay, this is homogeneous, again, okay, heterogeneous is multiplied by a factor. This is, a, there's two terms of comp competition, okay? Just like if you put a, a glass of water in your freezer, that's a, how to form ice is a competition, right? Why is the, the volume of the, this ice? The volume should be negative because otherwise it will not form ice, right? In, in water in the freezer, which means one form ice has a low energy, so it's negative. This is the volume of the ice, okay? The so delta G is a free energy difference per unit volume, okay? And then there's the surface tension. Surface tension always positive because it form ice, you know, the surface tension always positive. So this is a gamma called uh, interfacial tension. So you basically, you have a competition between these two terms. That's a classical nuclear model. And um, when I when radius is very small, then this term become more important because it's proportion R squared. This term become less important. But when getting larger, this term become more important. So if you take a derivative, you you find out this is a critical radius R star. Okay. So the classical nuclear theory tells us okay, the ice just like a, the, the at the beginning this oscillation, but when I is smaller than R star, then they're unstable. Okay. Only if the fluctuates the R become R star, larger than R star, then become stable, they're going down like that. But we found it much more complicated than that. So we have the three observations that are inconsistent with the classical nuclear theory. First of all, each nucleus has a core of one to few atoms. 
with a maximum order parameter, then all the parameter gradient points from the core to the boundary of the nucleus. So classical nuclear theory assume this this uh, the nu nucleus, the inside arrangement is uniform. Okay, you, you don't have a core, but we found the core. And then nuclear undergo growth, fluctuation, dissolution, merging, and or division, which are regulated by all the parameters gradient. We found also early stage nuclear unisotropic, not like a sphere. This, this is a volume of sphere, four pi r cubed divided by three. And this is a four pi r squared. It's, it's kind of a, um, this is a surface. And my, so this result shows that a theory beyond the classical nuclear theory is needed to de describe the nucleation at an atomic scale. Okay. And uh, so finally, I'm gonna have a few slides talk about our recent work. I was just published a few weeks ago in Nature on a, determine the 3D atomic structure of an amorphous materials. And really for the first time, we look into the amorphous materials. And this is actually one of, also one of the important direction for our um, HDR. We want to look at amorphous disordered situation, right? So here I'm gonna show the movie of this. Um, let, let me just show the movie of this. Um, so there's three type of atoms, okay, red, blue, and green. Okay, there's three type of atoms. And um, you can see then we're going to go look at the uh, first on the surface in the disorder. You can't see much crystalline structure. And then we go to slice by slice. You can see most of the actual feature is more disordered, right? And uh, there are some actually uh, nucleus uh, in, inside the nanoparticles. And uh, you will see later, I'm going to show you that some nucleus, but most of more than 85%, uh, there's some, some new crystalline features here. Uh, kind of clear. But most of uh, actually, uh, it's a truly uh, amorphous structures. So type one, we have uh, 80 different elements. So this is a multi-component metal gas. This is type one, two, three, okay, for different. And we use uh, a few different parameters to quantify the uh, this amorphousness or disorderness. We use bound orientation order. Just the, uh, this kind of a mathematical tool to quantify whether it's a crystal, like a face centered cube, or, uh, hexagonal uh, close packed or BCC body centered packed, but this is quite a deviation. Most of the atoms quite a deviation from this crystal structures. We also plotted the radio distribution function. That's actually typical mass and diffusion study amorphous materials. You know these kind of like amorphous features. Right? And what do we find is we 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 first look at because we have atomic coordinates. We can look at. Uh, this uh, short range orders. So we call this Voronoi tessellation. This is a mathematical tool. So the question is, if this is not a crystal, how can we find the atoms, the short range or the atom and the neighboring atoms, right? We, we can find, we need to find the volume, the atom and the nearest neighbor atoms. So we use this called a Voronoi tessellation. Basically find the volume for each atom, the smallest volume for each atom. And then we can look at the, the nearest neighbor Atom and the nearest neighbor atoms. Okay, so this work we call the Voronoi index, index. Index. So this is a four number here. Here, so the, this first number corresponds three fold symmetry, four fold symmetry, five fold symmetry, six fold symmetry. Like in this case, you have the this one called the five fold symmetry. Right, this atom and connected. So we we can find this uh, distribution of the Voronoi indices and the. The largest one you can see is shown here. This kind of zero four four. See, what mean there's no three four symmetry. There's a four 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 symmetry, four five four symmetry, and three six four symmetry. Okay, and here shows icosahedral symmetry. Now icosahedral symmetry, many violets have icosahedral symmetry, which means all these have five four symmetry. Okay, so this is kind of we can look at short range order for the all the atoms, and then we can look at the connectivity of the short range order. Uh, which means each atom cluster is connected together. Here's shear one atom. You can see the two clusters shear one atom. And shear two atom, you shear three atoms, four atoms, five atoms. So most, uh, here is uh, histogram. You can see most of the atoms, the, most of the clusters shear two or three atoms. Because there's also percentage shear one atom. But the five atoms are very small. Okay. And the most important discovery of this work is the first uh, directed observation of the medium range order. So medium range, short range order is, Atom and the neighboring. So, which means the distance about angstroms. But the medium range order ordering means a few nanometers. Now, crystal means long range ordering. That can be a millimeter or centimeters, so even, mil even meters, right? Crystal can be very large. So, we found there are uh, four different types of medium range orders. One is the FCC, face and cubed. Okay. So, these are each clusters, they form this kind of a, uh, FCC structures. Now, here we only show the, the the center atom of the cluster. The center atoms, you can see, they're kind of a pattern. So there's some very interesting pattern. It's not a complete disorder. 
That's that's the main point. Of, and uh, so each one, each is dashed uh, so, uh, circle corresponds that uh, cluster, right? The cluster atom and the neighboring. And uh, they have, have uh, um, translational um, periodicity, which corresponds, but uh, rotationally there's no, no uh, periodicity. There's no rotational periodicity. So it's, we call it crystal-like, it's FCC-like, it's really FCC-like. And here shows HCP, okay? Hexagonal um, closed packed HCP. Um, here I show only a center atom, this uh, uh, HCP. Here shows uh, BCC, okay? The BCC, the cen center atom shows the BCC and this uh, simple cubic, we call it SC. So we can look at all these four different types. We don't see any other type, we don't see the, and there was other pre, uh, theoretical study predicted there were, or MD study they predicted there was a um, icosahedral packing of the MR or medial range order, but we actually didn't observe that. So here we find the coexisting of the four types of crystal like MR in the metallic glasses okay, FCC like, HCP like, BCC like, SC like, and they coexist inside here. You can see different color correspond different uh, crystal like, right? And we also can. Look at the percentage of FCC HCP a higher percentage, more than 30%, and the BCC SC is a small percentage. And the size of MR, this, this number corresponds how many clusters, okay? Five in five clusters, the largest 23 cluster. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the, the size about a, a little the, the cluster of the MRO, uh, the median range order size about the uh, averages over, over two nanometers. So that's that kind of so which means there's order in disorders. It's amorphous, not a complete amorphous. So our experimental results provide direct experimental evidence to support the general framework of the efficient cluster packing model for metallic glasses. They coexist in the four types of crystal-like MR in the same in the sample, indicates MR in real metallic glasses are more complicated than previous thought. Because this uh, efficient packing model only assumes this should have an FCC and an HCP, but we find actually four types coexist inside the sample. So now, after we solved the structure, we published the paper, we immediately deposited the structure in this kind of materials data bank. So we try to learn from the PDB, as I mentioned earlier. PDB is an information portal uh, to more than 100, now it's more than 150,000 biological macromolecules. You know, like uh, COVID-19 structures, the, 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 the protein structures also deposited in the protein. Ever since, so whenever I solve the protein structure, deposit. The PDB was developed in 1960 at Brooklyn National Lab, now become a really, it's a very important uh, data bank for life science and biological community. But for the physical science and material science, we don't have that materials data bank. So our goal, we have, we created, uh, since uh, more than a year ago, we created a material data bank, and you can find this link. It's a database for the 3D atomic coordinates, individual atom real materials, and correlating 3D structure with material property and functionality. So all of the structure we solved deposited there and people can freely download and can freely deposit. And finally, I want to mention a, a, few, a few words about this, uh, um, this NSF Science Technology Center, actually Margaret Mona is a director and I'm the deputy director. And uh, I thought this is really very much related, uh, have a uh, complemented to the HDI Institute if we get it. And this, uh, we call it STROBE, it's Advanced Integrated Dynamic Imaging Techniques using electron X-ray nanoprobe microscopy to collectively tackle major scientific and technology challenges. So we, we, we try to really solve many important problems in energy materials, quantum materials, disorder materials, biological materials, and we use new methods, detect bigger data, advanced algorithm, and machine learning. So we have uh, some wonderful um, universe, uh, collaborators in from uh, University of Colorado Boulder, UCLA, UC Berkeley, and from in terms of education, Florida, Florida International, and Foot Race, and, and also UC Irvine, and also national labs involved in this part. So, so in the summary, so CDI method have been applied to image a wide range of samples in the physical and biological sample, uh, sciences. And soft X-ray vector tachography was developed to directly observe magnetic monopoles and probe their interactions. So AT was used to determine the 3D coordinates, individual atoms, the crystal defects, and 2D materials with a precision down to four picometers. And the 4D AT was developed to capture atomic motion, showing that classical nuclear theory breaks down at the atomic scale. So AT was advanced to solve a central order, really a central order problem, and determine the 3D 
uh, atomic structure of uh, amorphous solid because the, the first atomic structure solved is salt in 1914. And, uh, and that's used a crystal, but for an amorphous non-crystalline sample, this is really for the first time. And the CDI-AT are truly data-driven and cross-disciplinary method for materials characterization and discovery. And uh, finally, I want to thank all my uh, collaborators and, um, and my group members, and uh, many of them become faculty members uh, in, around the world. And um, I have a strong collaboration with Margaret and Monet and Henry Kaplan's group. Also, uh, I, uh, Margaret and Henry have collaborated for more than 14 years. And Hendrik, actually, we, we've been collaborating for probably more than seven, 80 years. And it's really also a wonderful collaboration. And as a, as a, for the Berkeley LBN, Peter Urshis and the calling office, as a, uh, and um, Andreas Schmidt and David Shapiro is a very, very important part. And uh, we also have a you know, math, mathematician, uh, Min Fan, Qi Wei, and Stan Osher. Um, and we have some, so we have really some wonderful collaboration in terms of sample fabrication, uh, experiment, uh, data acquisition, and the data analysis, and develop new algorithms, uh, solve important problems in material science. So this is a truly a cross discipline field. And, and we have enormous data. You know, we get a terabytes data <laughs> in a couple of days. And, um, and I think in the machine learning, we are also working on machine learning, deep learning, machine learning, deep, and that's will play a very important role um, in this field. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, John, for this uh, fantastic talk. Uh, it's a really pleasure to, to see this uh, fundamental science and some, some inspiring applications. So, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, I enjoy. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's uh, I, as I mentioned, we are well, we are doing very cross disciplinary, and it is actually I think it's a good match. We, we need uh, mathematician, computer scientists, you know, uh, machine learning, and big data. And big data has become even more and more problem because our detector getting faster and faster. That's we we we, we have a new newest detector at the Brookhaven National Lab. That's actually the best the, the kind of state of art, truly state of art. We. After a few minutes, after like a, one hour, get a terabytes of data. Then, then the data actually is stored in the computer, in the detector. Then you transfer took like a, a few days. That's a problem. You, you just took one hour data, and then you took a one day or two days to transfer data from the uh, detector to, to the computer. That's a problem. So, I mean, all kinds of problems. Uh, that that uh, requires, you know, um, um, hopefully we'll get the institute and then, can help us solve, solve some of the important problems. So John, uh, Horacio here, a beautiful talk. You did everything I would have loved to do. <laughs> beautiful work, beautiful work. Uh, thank you, thank you. No, I was joking. I was saying you did everything I would have loved to do. <laughs> well, I know, yeah. So well, so far, so most, many, so, so for the um, actually work, CDI mainly we use, um, bigger facilities because they have the um, powerful x resource. Like uh, Honey and Margaret group, they're developing the tabletop, high harmonic generation. So one of their goals is try to make it a kind of a tabletop. So eventually we will be able to, um, you know, this will become a popular, can be done, uh, you know, in the, in the lab. And for the AET, actually, this can be done in the lab. lab in the lab. And if you have a microscope, I'm sure there are microscope in Northwestern. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good electron microscopy. This can be done. We actually put everything online. Whenever we publish, we put software, raw data, all the data online. So you know, people yes. can access those kind of the code. Um, we also will uh, try to organize some workshops to training, actually workshop of graduate student and postdoc. We did it once at a book camp. Uh, at a, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, just a kind of a training workshop for students and uh, right, right. Um, postdocs to learn those techniques. And uh, yeah. we were happy after the pandemic, we were happy to do that again. And with this HDI student, that's a great uh, venue. We, we will be happy to train this uh, new generation because there's a lot of, uh, it's truly cross discipline. You, you know, not just a physicist, not enough, you need material scientists, chemists, yeah. right? The impact of chemists. And then you need a, Computation, you, you need a mathematics. This is uh, kind I of- I have a, a, a comment on, on the nucleation theory. <clears throat> that formula is for a isotropic nucleation. Mm -hmm. You may compare maybe if there is in the literature anisotropic, mm -hmm. because for instance, the, the gamma, yes. when it's a function of 
and that may agree better with your theory. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Actually, we started that. That's a very good point. I, I because I didn't have a time to talk about. We we actually we 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 develop a new theory for that. Even you talk about it, gamma. You use different gamma, which means different facets. You have a different gamma. That's understandable. That's true indeed. Uh, that's actually have been observed. But mm -hmm. the problem with the uh, um, uh, classical nuclear theory is inside it's a uniform, always a, some uniform. What we find is it has a core. Every nuclear has a core. So the core have a one or few atoms. And it, so now we actually uh, did a more study. We have, the, we have prepared another paper actually. Originally this work was, we will have a theory that, and, and the experiment combined was actually with some middle of nature actually. Both roughly like it, but the third one somehow, and I thought of, it's, it's kind of a, a little unethical. While he reviewing our paper, he submitted a paper to Science Advance. So his paper published before our Nature paper. I mean, he said that. I mean, but uh, because we, we post on archive, he, he cited our archive paper. And he's strong against it. So our, eventually, the, the Nature editor said, okay, you remove the theoretical part, we will publish it. So we, so we propose a model, actually. We found using our model, I mean, it's still post an archive. The energy value can be lower. So it's you now if, it, if it's a uniform, just like ice you form from water, it's a uniform, you have a sharp boundary. Even, even you have an unisotropic, you have a sharp boundary for example, ice and water. Mm -hmm. Hence the gamma is very large. If it's sharp boundary, it's a, but we find a smooth boundary. Nature chooses a smooth boundary. Then the energy value is lower for, for uh, because the, the surface tension part is smaller. And we found always in this case the energy is lower. So we, we, we're going to work uh, yeah, <laughs> with one theory. And uh, um, yeah, that's a very good point. But can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, John, I mean, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. I think I learned a lot. Um, uh, from, I guess I have a high level question, also a detailed question. The high level question is that, um, uh, with all this beautiful data that you generate, including, for example, in the end, when you show this uh, network, which kind of, the, you have multi-scale in some sense, the lower level, you have this Voronoi diagram, you get the neighborhood, and the um, uh, higher level, you have kind of connection between those uh, clusters that you mentioned, right? So what do you want to do with them? I mean, from a data analysis point of view, what would be the type of question that you hope to, yeah. So, so right now, I mean, this is just like unexplored area because first of all, nobody has seen amorphous materials before. So it's just like, a, for me, it's a gold mine. Right now, we just focus on one part. We want to show whether there's a model. Previously, there's some kind of a model called efficient packing model. The efficient packing model just like give you disordered atoms, just like a, like a, disorder, like a ball you put in a, in a bucket. They're not a crystal disorder. What's, what's the efficient way of packing? So that's kind of a, um, the proposal model. So we, we just uh, well, 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 want to verify whether well, that's true or not. There's some debating between the community at that time before our work. So why is the claim this form should be, uh, they have should be me medium range order, some nanometer scale, they form this called FCC or HCP kind of a crystalline features. And the other one should form icosahedral kind of medium range order. So we actually didn't see icosahedral order. So we, we see more kind of a HCP, uh, FCC, and we also see a centered cubic and a BCC. So this is actually only one kind of a duration. There's could be other important duration. We even don't know how to analyze this because we have, we got like, you know, 20,000 atoms, right? And what's the way to analyze? I mean, are, I'm sure there are some in, very interesting features and we, we will get more data. So how to take advantage of this? The crystalline is easy, right? Crystal, you know, FCC, yeah. always. Exactly. But if it's disordered, you have so many atoms. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it could be that, uh, it's, it's a so it could be that um, the locally right now, you identify this FCC or BCC type local pattern, but it could be that actually there are other, I mean, there, there could there be are some other patterns, patterns yeah. just the, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. What, what, the importance of that is that if you want to predict, for instance, what is the strength of the material mm -hmm. and or what is the type of defects that may nucleate that right. will induce failure. I studied, for instance, uh, glasses, and mm -hmm. we all know that glasses are brittle. Yes. But it's very interesting because when you compress them in all directions, it develop instabilities, like shear phase transformations. 
And if you want to understand from where they could originate, yes, this type of information is essential because you can run molecular dynamic simulations, but you never know, you know, how accurate it is. So yeah. that's the other important information you convey in your presentation that to gain uh, understanding in terms of models are models, even density functional theory is a model. So mm. how, how well they predict the data and mm. how you can gain confidence to extract information when you run simulations and start predicting the failure initiation and propagation. So all these things are you know, extremely important. Yeah, now that's actually a really good point. I mean, for defects in crystal easy, I mean, it was difficult before, but use our technique easy, you can see atom missing in the lattice. But now it's amorphous. So how do you define the defects, right? Because yeah, they're disordered. So the defect definition is, uh, there's no kind of clear definition of defect. There's some hand waving. First of all, nobody's seen it before. That's actually really, I, I felt, you know, the 20th century is the crystallography, I mean, the crystal structure. 21st century, I really feel amorphous disorder because we don't know much. Right now, our technology is based on the crystal because, you know, it's easy, it's well characterized. But for disorder, although nature, you know, most on Earth, as a non-crystalline structure, right? The water is non-crystalline, glass non-crystalline, most non-crystalline. So I, I feel the non-crystalline is it's, it's really important direction, and uh, it's a lot of unknown. I mean, it's uh, it's unexplored, like, like a defects and amorphous material. How do? That's a very good question. I mean, actually, it's on Lefley also and the editor actually also asked. It. But even how to define this diva? I mean, we have to. So we have to look based on some kind of a. Guidelines. So, what's the guideline? We have to develop our yeah, own yeah. guideline. Why we have to? It, it's yeah. a lot harder for uh, this amorphous structure because you don't have one type of defect. You can think at many potential type of defects. Yes, yes. And the idea is: there any dominant one that emerges in the yeah. structure? It's like, you know, in brittle materials, you can initiate failure somewhere because there are in, imperfections, and people were able to like Weibull say, okay, the dominant imperfection dominates the process. So here you can start, you know, having some framework for answering questions about the strength and the initiation. And that may be material dependence. So this type of characterization or process independence, this, this type of characterization brings everything together with machine learning. And that's the power. Yeah. That you can have different processes and, and different performance of the material but you could characterize in this way and analyze computationally. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Horacio. I think this uh, hopefully we will, we'll, uh, yeah, we, we, we get this funding and then get HDI Institute, then we can work together on this. I mean, I think yeah. it's exciting, really. I mean, yeah. It's very exciting areas, yeah. yeah. Because it's outside the main stream in terms of what, how you can reduce to, to non concept you, you are discovering here. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great input for the for for the computational models, and, and then at the same time, uh, also it, it reveals you know some of these correlations. Like uh, it can be electronic structure, like you know, yeah, it does maybe you know the band gap change, but then also a, a, any other properties, you know, like mechanical or or magnetic could be also interesting actually. So like you know. Yeah, how, for how this is affected by by substitution. Uh, how, uh, yeah, how how it affects assembly also if we have building blocks or so. You know, it, it, when it goes to the larger scale, like you know, some people are experimenters will use the material, and then we don't know uh, otherwise how you know what's the mechanism uh, for that. So, 